In this presentation, you're going to see the model of Christian life that was considered acceptable, common, in the lifetime of Francis and Claire. We would call it monastic life today. And certainly the most popular form was the Benedictine monasticism that had begun in Italy centuries before Francis and Claire. And its reform, the reform of St. Bernard of Clairvaux and those who preceded him, the Cistercian reform. Again, it's Benedictine monasticism, but it is a return, if you like, to what they considered to be uh, the true spirit of St. Benedict. But this model actually has much deeper roots. Uh, they would have called it monastic life in Latin, vita monastica, but they would also be likely to call it the life of the apostles, the vita apostolica, that life which is described in the second chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to take some time to actually examine the text that were used most often from the book of Acts as a way of imagining how a Christian community can be organized. That tradition of organizing the common life of Christians in a way that resembled that of the early church of Jerusalem had a very strong hold in the Middle Ages as it had in previous generations and as it still exists today. But that model took on new meaning when it became part of an isolated agricultural monastery based in the feudal system where lands were worked by peasants or serfs and where the original intention of St. Benedict that monks should both work and pray, ora et labora, was obscured in some of the bigger medieval monasteries. One example we're going to look at is the, the really immense mammoth monastery of Cluny in France. This single monastery founded in the early 900s had expanded and expanded over time and had drawn other monastic communities into its orbit. So it became something like an international religious order uh, with its headquarters in Cluny in France. Over a thousand monasteries by the 12th century were affiliated with this, this engine of monastic life at Cluny. The problem was, and this is one of the things that the Cistercian reform was opposed to, was losing that contact with manual labor that seemed so important for monks in the rule of St. Benedict. There was another aspect to this monasticism which created reactions among reformers, not simply in monastic communities, but also among people like Francis and Claire. And that was the enormous wealth that was accumulated. The gift of a dowry of usually property for a monastery at first might supply a, a field of peas here and a field of hay there, enough to graze a few cows or sheep necessary for the, the food of the monastery. But as hundreds of years pass and hundreds of monks or nuns have come to the monastery donating part of their inheritance, their family lands to the monastery, these become vast territories with smaller monasteries dotted across the countryside, priories or granges, just to be able to control the workforce of penance or sometimes lay volunteers called converts or conversi. If this was called the apostolic life, then the problem with it and one that Francis and Claire reacted against without criticizing it. The problem is that you are keeping all your property in common. That is the, the energy, the economic energy is inwards toward sustaining the community. 
The community, of course, also had special buildings and services designed to help the poor who came to the door of the monastery. The needs of the poor were not forgotten, but we might say that the poor were able to, to survive out of the excess wealth produced in the monastery. For those who wanted to look at a different model of life, they said, what would it would be like if instead of putting all of our property in common to take care of us, we were to follow that example suggested, not commanded by Jesus in the gospel, to take what we have, that family inheritance, that dowry, whatever we have available to us as resources, and let us sell that and distribute that income to the poor as the first step of following Christ. Then come follow me, you will have treasure in heaven. That produces quite a different economic system because the expropriation of the person professing the gospel way of life concretely enriches the poor who are the recipients of that donation of money, resources, uh, whatever that was. If we look at the example of Francis and Claire and put it up against the example, the exaggerated example of monastic life from Cluny, you can see what a great difference there is. The contrast could not be more dramatic. This may help to explain why this new way of life seemed innovative to people of the time. It was not well understood. It was considered a bit um, overly idealistic, I suppose. But the genius of Francis and Claire is that they made it work. They figured out ways by which their own work and recourse to begging alms when necessary could actually support a community without the need for all of this landed property with these peasants working it day and night, needing overseers and supervisors and accountants. Could it be possible to have a much lighter life, less burdened by property and land and fields and water mills and fishing rights? Could they be a little lighter on their feet, more itinerant? If so, that brings them another step closer to that ideal that they had, how the disciples follow Jesus in the gospel. In this presentation, I hope that you will understand that I'm not criticizing monasticism even though it can appear that way. I'm rather trying to take a look at it from a particular point of view to see how what was initially in the Acts of the Apostles, putting together the few resources of a small community of the persecuted minority in Jerusalem becomes very different when it's applied to new recruits who are coming from nightly and noble families in France and whose parents are gladly donating large tracts of land and valuable property to keep this community formed after the model of the church at Jerusalem, but to keep them at a certain level of decent comfort, a respectable life for the children of the nobility who were destined to be the leaders and most of the members of the Benedictine communities of the time. So I would ask you to listen sympathetically to the account of the Acts of the Apostles. And again, look sympathetically at it as it is interpreted through later generations, through the lens of the rule of St. Benedict and its reforms, or through the lens of Cluny uh, with its vast land holdings, provoking movements of reform, even within monasticism. I hope you enjoy the PowerPoint presentation and also the suggested readings that you will find listed for you on the course website.
Welcome to this lecture on the gospel as form of life, the innovation of Francis and Claire of Assisi. In the time of Francis and Claire, the most common form of organizing Christian life was called the life of the apostles, the Vita Apostolica. It was based on the book of the Acts of the Apostles, especially chapter two. Here we see a community led by the apostles after the death and resurrection of Christ, a community that was born after the ascension, that is at Pentecost. The headquarters of this community originally were in Jerusalem until its destruction under the Romans in the year 70. This community, the early Christian community, was centered on the liturgy of the temple, attending the various hours of prayer. While gathering in their homes, for the specifically Christian liturgy of the breaking of the bread or the Eucharist. This was a community in which property was held in common and all the needs of those in the community were provided for, for example, by the deacons. This common model meant to live according to the acts of the apostles and if we look at chapter two, verses 42 to 47, we see the major elements of this form of early Christian community life. Speaking of the believers, St. Luke writes in Acts that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. It may seem unusual to us, but this model formed the inspiration for much of early Christian monastic life as well. The monastic life was considered to be a new representation of the life of the apostles. The early Christian monasteries used the model of the apostolic church at Jerusalem as a model for their life together. In this way, Jerusalem was interpreted as the monastery itself. The apostles teaching was interpreted as the teaching of the Abba or Amma, the abbot or the abbess. The temple was now the monastic church. The breaking of bread and the prayers were now the mass and the divine office celebrated together. And to have all things in common meant donating property on entrance to support the monastic community. The idea of a new Jerusalem, that is the Jerusalem of the future, was also associated with the Christian monastery. And a phrase from the book of Revelation was used to confirm this interpretation. I saw the holy city, writes St. John, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. On the left, we see a rendering in an artist's perspective of what the city of Jerusalem may have looked like in the first century of the Christian era, 
with the temple prominently in the middle. On the right, the figure of the Lord who is showing to St. John the Evangelist or John the writer of the book of Revelation, the new heavenly city of Jerusalem, which looks a lot like a monastery with its church in the center surrounded by high walls. The Jerusalem temple pictured here in a reconstruction was equivalent to the monastic church where the community gathered. And the phrase from Acts chapter two was used as the model for Christian prayer in the monastery. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple. And we know that in the Middle Ages, Christian monks would spend sometimes six to seven hours a day chanting the divine office in the new temple, the monastic church. But we also read in the book of Acts, chapter two, verse 42, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and to prayer. How do we find these elements expressed in the monastic interpretation of the life of the apostles. The breaking of bread was, I believe, rightly interpreted as referring to the celebration of the Eucharist, the mass. And the hours of prayer in the temple of Jerusalem were interpreted as the divine office. And in fact, we know that early versions of the divine office celebrated in the church at Jerusalem drew on the earlier Jewish hours of prayer in the temple. Having all things in common is an important feature of this early Christian community. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. This perhaps idealized version of the church at Jerusalem in the telling of St. Luke became an inspiration also for Christian monasteries. To have all things in common was interpreted as meaning the monastic property that was held in common by the community. Those who were entering the community as monks or nuns would donate property, usually land, as a dowry when entering the monastery. All the donated lands became part then of common property of the monastic community, as pictured here in example from Chertsey Abbey in England in the late Middle Ages. The income from the produce of the land supports the community. But as the years passed, of course, more property is added to the monastic property year by year. And a large community, after many years, could possess extensive land holdings, including fishing rights on rivers. You can see here at the top of the slide, the River Thames mills on streams, you can see on the right hand of the slide, Ox Lake Mill, timber from forests, you can see stylized trees pictured below Lalem Village common land. Vineyards, well at this time in England I don't think that grapes grew particularly well, but in Italy and France they would be an important component. And finally, the farming fields themselves, surrounding the monastery, originally worked by the monks, but as monasteries grew larger, increasingly worked by serfs or peasants who were attached to the monastic property. 
the hours of prayer in the temple mentioned reverently in the book of Acts are translated as the hours of the divine office in the church. As for example, the text from Acts chapter six, verse three. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. This was called the ninth hour. There were special times of prayer in the temple at the third hour, mid morning, at the sixth hour at midday, and at the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. These become the monastic offices of terse, sext, and known. As the early community at Jerusalem gathered to listen to the apostles' teaching and to join in fellowship, pictured here on the left with St. Peter preaching to a crowd in Jerusalem, the equivalent for the Christian monastery was the conference or the daily teaching given by the abbot or the abbess in the monastic chapter frequently commenting on scripture, on the rule, or on the writings of the church fathers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. We're going to study the example of Francis and Claire. They will choose a new way, the life of the gospel, or the vita evangelica. That is, they will break with the previous tradition and set out on a new path, looking not to the book of the Acts of the Apostles as their guide, but earlier in the New Testament, to Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, but also with excerpts from the Gospel of John. In the next presentation, we will explore just how different a Christian community looks when it takes the gospel rather than the book of Acts as its inspiration. <laughs>